so, um, and of course, uh, the two, both the LGBT movement and the atheist movement are very strongly opposed by religion. Uh, and a lot of the, the hostility against us and the arguments against us are made by, by organized religion. So, um, and one of the things that I often say is that the atheist movement is right now in uh, 2010, is about where the LGBT movement was in the early 70s, in the early days of right after the Stonewall riots when the movement was becoming very visible and very vocal and very active and much less apologetic and much more in your face. Um, that was happening in the LGBT movement in around the early 70s. And there had been a, a movement and people organizing before that, just like there have been atheists uh, organizing for decades before the so-called new atheist uh, movement. Uh, but clearly in the last few years, we've kind of moved into overdrive. And what, what I, you, yeah. um, I'm just saying, what, what would you say the atheist equivalent of Stonewall was? Um, I think that the atheist equivalent of Stonewall was 9-11. Uh, I think that that's the event that got a lot of people saying, I have to do something about this. I can't stand by and watch. I can't just say, well, I don't believe in God. I don't have a religion, but that's okay. I'm going to live and let live. Religion doesn't do that much harm, and I don't feel like rocking the boat. Uh, I think that 9-11 got a lot of people saying, okay, enough of this. Religion does a huge amount of harm in the world. It just killed thousands of people in one horrible morning and I can't stand by and watch. Also, 9-11 was what inspired uh, Sam Harris to write his book, The End of Faith, and that was the first of the big atheist bestsellers. And I think that that's, that kind of got the ball rolling on a lot of that. Absolutely. I've, I've noticed that one real strength of the LGBT movement has it been its effectiveness at building a sense of empathy with people outside of the community. Like, for instance, if uh, there were a US senator who were to make a bigoted remark about gays or lesbians, you'd have basically the liberal blogosphere crag in half and uh, basically calling for the guy's head, calling him out, um, and he would have forced, even a really conservative one, be forced to make some kind of apology. Um, this hasn't been the case for atheists yet. Uh, when a prominent media feeder, uh, figure attacks us, it seems like only atheists seem to speak out against mm -hmm. it. Um, I imagine that's been the case with LGBT activists for decades. It has been, yes. Um, how did they change that, and how can atheists change that? Well, one of the main things that uh, we need is just time. Uh, you know, the L when, certainly when the LGBT movement was getting off the ground, nobody else was speaking for us, or hardly anybody else was speaking for us. Um, you know, we pretty much had to stand up and speak for ourselves. Uh, you know, there was a certain amount of alliance building that was done. Harvey Milk, for instance, was very good at that uh, when he was a supervisor in San Francisco. He was good at building alliances with the labor movement and with the seniors movement. Uh, but for the most part, we were speaking for ourselves, and a lot of that is just time. And a lot of it also is coming out, and this is another, I think, huge parallel between the atheist movement and the LGBT movement, is that coming out is the single most important political act that we can take. It's by far uh, the thing that we can do best to change people's ideas about us. Uh, that's certainly true for LGBT people. Uh, polls consistently show that the number one factor in determining whether somebody has positive or negative attitudes about gay people is whether they know one, or whether they know that they know one, I should say, because lots of people, they know gay people, they just don't necessarily know that they do. Um, so when gay people come out of the closet and disclose to whoever they can comfortably, uh, to their friends, to their family, to their coworkers, um, uh, that simple act goes a huge way to demolishing a lot of the myths about about us. And that's and it also goes a long way to getting other people wanting to defend us. It's it's when uh, if you think you don't know any gay people, you think they're just they're they're those others, they're outside. Uh, I don't know anybody like that, and you're more likely to believe a lot of the myths uh, of, you know, and some of the bigotry about us. So when, but when people know that they know somebody who's gay. They have to apply the stereotypes to reality. Exactly, they have to apply the stereotypes to reality or question the stereotypes. They say, well, but that's not true of Jane, that's not true of Fred, that's not true of these people I know. And that makes them more likely to want to stand up for us as allies. Uh, so I think that that's a huge amount of it. Uh, when atheists, the more atheists can come out, uh, there's sort of, and there's also sort of a snowball effect. It's like the more of us come out, the more other people feel comfortable coming out because there's safety in numbers. Uh, and because 
you know, it's again another parallel with the LGBT community is there's a certain amount of self-hatred. Uh, people don't want to come out as LGBT because they have themselves bought into the stereotypes. They themselves have bought into the idea that, you know, that they're immoral, that they don't have any sexual morals, that they're unhappy, that they're crazy, that their lives are tortured, whatever. Um, and so they don't want to identify. And so the more they see, so it's uh, that gay people can be happy, that the gay people can be moral, that we can be functioning positive members of society who have something to contribute, that makes them feel more comfortable coming out and uh, internally identifying as gay and also coming out. And I think that's true for atheists as well. A lot of people don't want to identify as atheist, not because their, of their own beliefs, if you know, if you ask them what do they believe, it's like, well, well, no, I don't believe in God, or I think that the God hypothesis is unlikely or implausible. Uh, but because they've bought into the stereotypes about atheists, they're uncomfortable identifying as one. And the more of us who can come out, it doesn't just make uh, people who aren't atheists more willing to stand up for us. It also makes uh, other non-believers feel comfortable joining the movement. So, so just to continue yeah. that, one more thing. Sure. Um, so coming out is a huge part of it. Uh, that's one of the main things that we can do to get other people to stand up for us. I also think that we need to do more positive, proactive work doing alliance building. Um, uh, you know, doing, you know, work with, you know, civil liberties organizations, uh, even with, you know, progressive religious groups uh, who share our opinions about, say, separation of church and state, even if they don't share our opinions about uh, God. Uh, and, you know, doing more to do alliances with the feminist movement, uh, with the African-American movement, with the environmentalist movement um, uh, on issues that we have in common. Uh, the more we can do that and the more those groups, you, you know, it's, it's alliance building isn't just about getting other people to help us. We need to be willing to, if we put energy into helping them, then they'll, and to stand up for their issues and their rights, uh, then they're going to be more willing to speak up for us. How, how do you feel the atheist community has done at, at doing that? Um, I think that we haven't done a great job yet at doing a lot of alliance building. Uh, we've done a certain amount. I mean, certainly I've talked with student groups uh, who do things like service projects. You know, they'll, uh, there was a group at, I believe it was Purdue University, uh, that uh, worked with a, one of the campus Christian groups to uh, go down during spring break uh, to New Orleans and help rebuild after Katrina. And so there are some people who are doing it. For the most part, I think, and, and this is appropriate because we're still a relatively young movement, we've mostly been working on, uh, on building ourselves. You know, we're trying, to, we're trying to herd the cats. <laughs> you know, we're trying to get people to come out. We're trying to create safe spaces for people to come out into to some extent. Uh, we're trying to make ourselves visible. We're trying to work on our own issues. And I think that's appropriate. But we've been doing that for a few years now, and I think that it's time for us to start uh, seeing ourselves as part of the social change movement more broadly and, uh, and do more of that. I'd like to see us doing more. Yeah, definitely. Because one thing I have noticed is it's, it's, it's immediately there's this reaction to simply saying that you disagree with somebody on a question mm -hmm. of faith, and it doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem like other people notice that when they state something that's the opposite of somebody like saying, I believe that the only way to God is through Jesus, they are in effect saying to other people, even in other religions, that they are wrong. Why do you think that the atheist stigma is so there? I mean, I, I've read several of your articles on Alternet mm -hmm. and the, uh, the comments. I mean, these are liberals. This isn't, this isn't just um, you know, people coming in from the Discovery Institute to, mm -hmm. to scream at you. A lot of the same canards are still there. I mean, how do we, how do we fight that? those sort of misconceptions? Uh, well, some of it is just time. Uh, how we fight misconceptions against us is just repetition. We have to just keep saying and saying and saying, no, that's not true. Um, one of the things that I write about a lot is uh, patience, is how the atheist movement needs to be patient. Um, and by that, I don't mean accommodationist and sitting back and waiting. Uh, but uh, I think it's easy to forget that We've made these same arguments over and over again. We've made them dozens of times. We've made them hundreds of times. But the person that we're talking with, they haven't heard it before. You know, it's like, you know, the, the hundredth time that I have to argue against Pascal's wager, you know, it makes me want to tear my hair out and scream. It makes me want to smack people. Um, but I have to remember, they haven't heard it. They haven't thought about this. They think this is a new idea. And so to some extent, it's just a matter of time. We have to keep talking. We have to keep you know, just keep making our case. 
I do think that though there's something that we need to accept that the atheist movement needs to acknowledge and that is there is a difference between the atheist movement and the LGBT movement and that's that the LGBT movement isn't telling straight people that they're mistaken to be straight. And we are saying that. You know, there's no way of getting around that. I mean, we can be polite about it. We can say, look, we can, I, we can work with you. We can coexist. But there's no way of getting around the fact that atheists are saying, we think religious believers are mistaken. When you say, I don't believe in God, you're saying people who do believe in God, they're wrong. Um, and I think that we have to just acknowledge that there's some degree that we're always going to rub people the wrong way. Um, because we are saying to people, you're mistaken. Now, we can say we think you're mistaken, but we can still work together on issues that we have in common. Uh, we can say we can agree to disagree. We can set that particular disagreement aside for the moment and move on to other issues. Uh, we can talk about the Yankees game, whatever. Uh, but I do think we have to acknowledge that atheism is different from other social change movements in a lot of ways because of that. Um, and because religion relies on sort of social agreement to continue. Religion relies on people not questioning it. It relies on uh, this sort of social consensus that we won't ask the hard questions, that we won't say, but what evidence do you have for that? Uh, that we will just sort of accept people's personal experience and intuition and the authority of the holy texts and what our parents taught us. Um, religion relies on that. It's like the emperor's new clothes. And the very fact that atheists are saying the emperor has no clothes, even if we say it in the most mild-mannered way possible, even if all we're saying is, I don't believe in God, there, again, there's no way to say that without undercutting the foundation that religion is built on. And I think to some extent we have to just accept that. It's, it's never going to be easy.